Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well done. My name is Karen Mills, and I am so honored to be your service leader this morning for this very special service. I uh, would like to welcome everyone here, and uh, if it's your first time, if it's your 41st time, if it's your 101st time, uh, please feel welcome and know that you are a valued member of this community. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, religious, multi-generational community, and we celebrate a rich mosaic of free thinking, spiritual questing individuals who join in common support and action. We welcome diversity, pursue the common good, and work for justice, and we believe in the compassion of the individual heart, the warmth of community, and the search for meaning in our lives. We gather with gratitude this morning on Treaty 6 territory, and I was reminded of what a special privilege that is yesterday at a concert that um, featured Coca Pelli and Musica Intima and a lot of music by Andrew Belfour, who is an Indigenous composer from Winnipeg, now based in Toronto, and an Indigenous composer from Edmonton. And um, the talk about how you know, reconciliation is not an act. It's an ongoing way of life. And what a beautiful demonstration it was to see people of all ages singing in Cree, in Mi'kmaq, in uh, Cree Iroquois, and just with such joy and such grace. And so uh, we're very grateful to share that heritage and recognize that a treaty is an inheritance and may we be good stewards of this planet and good ancestors to all of our children. For this special hour together, I invite you to quiet anything that might beep or buzz or <laughs> otherwise interrupt our time together. And we are going to begin our time this morning with a prelude from Gordon Ritchie.
Hmm. Let's soak that in. That was beautiful. Thank you, Gordon. I was thinking maybe we just cancel the rest of the service and Gordon could just play. <laughs> if that's all right. No, probably not. Good morning. What a lovely, wonderful crowd we've got this morning. My name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation. I'd like to acknowledge that we are here together in the sanctuary this morning, and that we are together also online, on, on Zoom, and we want to welcome those people into our midst as well. And perhaps there will be people watching in the future, so I would like to make sure that those people feel welcome as well. I'd like to say thank you for all of the people that are responsible for today's service. There was lots of work and talent and words and music that have gone into the preparation and what we have now this morning. Of course, as you can see, it's someone's birthday. So um, I'd like to acknowledge that it's our, our matriarch, uh, Ruth, one of our matriarchs, Ruth Patrick's 100th birthday this week. And I'm sure that some of you have come knowing that, and uh, we will be having a celebration. This whole service will be a celebration, and then afterwards, a luncheon together to acknowledge that. I'd like to read opening words by the Reverend Gretchen Haley. There is nothing you need to bring with you to be welcome here. No right beliefs or proof of citizenship. No eternal optimism or clarity of conviction. No boundless courage or endless expertise. You do not need to know what brought you here or how you will solve that problem that you're turning over and over and over and over in your mind. You don't have to pay your bills this morning, and you don't have to balance your checkbook. It couldn't be a mess. Your children may have been up half the night. Your hearing aids might not be working, and your knees might creak a little. You do not need to be already perfect, or even halfway perfect, to belong in this circle where grace meets us where we are, but does not leave us where it found us. Where love resides in each of us, yet is somehow more than all. Where life still pulses and rages and heals and transforms, creating us and this day anew once again. Come. Let us worship together. I'd like to call on Karen Mills to read our chalice lighting words and Joan Patrick to light our chalice this morning. Our words are by the Reverend Tellos Whitfield. With the kindling of our flame, we recognize the fragility of life and our own vulnerability as we navigate challenges that always seem to come. May this light remind us of the strength we possess as individuals and collectively as a community to lean into and respond, finding our way forward together. I'll invite you now to rise if you are feeling able to do that uh, as we sing hymn number 354, We Laugh, We Cry.
So something that we've started doing that's fairly new is having a service leader reflection. And so when Rosemary asked me to lead this service, she said, you know, I'd like you to do a reflection. And I thought, well, I don't really have much to say, I don't think, on vulnerability and community. And then I got thinking about it, and uh, wow, I've got a lot to say. <laughs> uh, but it was actually really brought home to me this week. Um, I come from pretty stoic Scandinavian stock, and talking about emotions and vulnerability and showing vulnerability, not really high on the list of things to do. But um, I work for a school division, and we've been talking a lot about just the disruption and the pain and the anxiety that we're seeing, and not just in our schools, but everywhere. And I think, you know, this week with all of the homicides that happened in Edmonton and the political rhetoric that we're hearing, it just seemed like things were spinning in a direction that was not very positive. And so we were talking about why. What's, what's happened that makes it that way? And, you know, a stock answer seems to be, well, it's pandemic fallout. You know, people were isolated, and so they, they don't know how to behave in social settings anymore, and, and we've lost, you know, that ability to connect. And, eh, you know, maybe a, that's probably a part of it. I think, though, that the pandemic actually just sped up what we were kind of already heading to. And that is just a lot of loneliness. Um, you know, I got kind of curious and, and was doing some research and looking into some things and, and finding that, you know, there's an, we have an aging population, more and more people are living alone, having fewer children, smaller families. Um, we seem to be busier and busier, but it's not in a community sense, it's in an individual sense. And we, um, you know, it's, I think it's really ironic. We have technology that enables us to be more connected than we've ever been in the history of the planet, but we're not using it to connect. It's, it's kind of driving that sense of isolation in that you can do everything at home. You don't have to go to a movie theater anymore. You can just, you know, download something off of a streaming service. Um, everything comes to you on your phone that you look down at uh, rather than conversation or listening to a common news uh, cast that you talk about at work or at school the next day. And, um, you know, the research that's starting to come out on uh, social media use is finding that the rates of drug abuse and the rates of internet use absolutely parallel one another. And as one goes up, so does the other. And so, you know, it's gotten to the point now where governments are starting to take note. And uh, in England, they did a study, and I, I had to read it a few times because, to use English terminology, I was absolutely gobsmacked um, at, at what they cited, that this was in 2018, so this is pre-pandemic times they found that over 200,000 people in England had not had a conversation with a friend or a relative in a month. Like that, that just seems unimaginable to me. 200,000 people, that's a city, hadn't had a conversation with a friend or a relative in a month. In Japan, they were noticing that the suicide rate amongst older women was skyrocketing because they were feeling isolated and alone. And so both governments, Japan and the UK, created a ministry of loneliness. And there's now a loneliness awareness week, and they're putting government funds in to see what they can do to um, get people connected, to try and alleviate this loneliness. Uh, and it just, again, that irony strikes me of, you know, how connected we can be and how alone we feel. And, and it you know, reminds me of, of the saying of you know, being lonely, being alone is not being lonely. Being lonely is being in a crowd and not feeling like you're part of it. And I think that really resonated with me. And it seems to be a vicious cycle too, that the more isolated you feel, the more it starts to manifest as, well, I must be doing something wrong, or people are not reaching out to me, people are not inviting me to be part of their groups, it must be something I'm doing. And so, 
it requires even more vulnerability on a person's part to put themselves out there, to take that risk, to try to be part of a group, to try to fit in somewhere. Um, and so, you know, I was kind of cycling in this not very good place thinking, oh, this is awful, what do we do? And then I got the opportunity to sit on a panel this week that was interviewing candidates to be CEO of a fairly large organization. And there were some pretty heavy hitters that were applying for this job, people who had run multinational companies with tens of thousands of employees. And one of the interview questions was, how do you define the role of CEO? I thought that was a pretty straightforward question. And one candidate answered, well, it just means I get paid to do what my job as a human being is, to build people. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that's, that's who I want to work for. Um, and so she went on to say, you know, what brings me joy, but also what I think is my duty, if I'm able to do it, is to find what motivates people, to build their skills, to reinforce their passions and to build on ramps and open doors for them so that they're as excited about their job every day as I am. And I thought, wow, we could, we could all do that. It's not rocket science. So, you know, part of me wondered, okay, what, what is it that's keeping us from doing that? And it came to vulnerability for me. Um, and a little bit of lizard brain, but I'll talk about that in a second. But I found a quote by Alain de Botton, who's a philosopher, and he said, you know, it's deeply poignant that we should expend so much effort on trying to look strong before the world, all the while it's really over the revelation of what's somewhat embarrassing, sad, maybe melancholy, and anxious that renders us endearing to others, that transforms strangers into friends. And I thought about that. It's like, nobody wants a perfect friend. I mean, you don't want to have to live up to that every day. But when somebody feels safe enough with you to share their true selves, to say, well, maybe I'm not having such a good day, or that didn't really go like I wanted it to, or, oh, you won't believe what a silly thing I did. That's when those connections can really spark. The lizard brain part that I was talking about is, that bit of our amygdala that still keeps us in fight or flight mode, that you know it's all about me, it's I have to survive, um, and it makes it easy to forget about what others are feeling sometimes. And I know I get into the habit, if everything's going well for me, I assume everything's going well for the rest of the world. And if things are not going for me, everybody in the world is miserable. Uh, which you know I've learned through time is not true, but it's easy to forget. But what I realize is how grateful I am for the people that have remembered that sometimes what they're feeling is not what everybody's feeling. And sometimes people need an on-ramp built for them or a door opened or a hand held out. And this also reminded me of Ruth because certainly as a social worker, she was aware of that. But I saw her do it over and over and over again as a builder of this community, as a strong force in the Canadian Unitarian Council, as a mover and shaker behind our vision movement, which was the welcoming congregation and the welcoming of uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans members, of the women's group that she so uh, passionately navigated and, and supported through for years. And so she is one of my strongest models that I look to as a door opener and a supporter and um, a connector of people. So all of that just brings me to say, may we all be CEOs in our everyday lives, building those people, opening the doors, giving a hand up and connecting and letting our vulnerable selves show. And now please join me in singing number 51, Lady of the Season's Laughter.
one of the values that we treasure and try to nurture in this congregation is a spirit of generosity. And I mean, that's certainly obvious through the volunteerism that happens all of the time and the community work that we do. But it's also shown each week as we take a collection to support the work of this church and also contribute half the unidentified contributions to an outside organization. And this month, the outside organization is the International Women's Convocation. And that's a Unitarian Universalist group uh, working for the empowerment of women. Uh, they do amazing work throughout the world, and that's where half of this month's contribution will go. And as the collection is being taken, I'll invite Andrew Mills, our Canvas Chair, forward to talk a little bit about this year's Canvas. In Reverend Rosemary's uh, opening words, she said, you're not going to have to pay bills today, and I'm here to tell you that that's wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> this is March, and March is Canvas Month, and we have an operating budget of about $320,000 a year, and we are exceptionally fortunate to have lots of sources of income. We raise money through uh, casinos. We actually have leased spaces in the front of the building, plus we rent the spaces here. Uh, that gives us about half of that, of that amount. So we need to raise uh, from our membership $160,000 this year. And we have 140 members, so let's do some math. That's $1,142 per member. So each member should be contributing about $1,200 a year. That's $100 a month. Uh, not everybody does that, and not everybody can afford that. That's fine. But if you're not paying $1,200 a month as a member, then someone else is paying for your membership. So I'd like everybody to think about that and to look at what their pledges, their annual pledges, and to think about what they can afford and what they can contribute to this church. Because no matter what, our current budget is going to require $1,200 per member to actually keep this church running. And so some people will have to contribute quite a bit more, some people will contribute quite a bit less. We actually have members who don't contribute anything, and those are always, those always make it difficult for me. And uh, if they can't afford it, genuinely can't afford it, that's fine. But if they can afford it, I would like them to contribute. So please fill out your pledge form. Uh, there are pledge forms at the back of the church. Uh, there's pledge forms in the lobby on the, uh, the Canvas poster. Uh, online at the UCE, if you go online to the UCE page, you will see um, uh, the donation page, and there's a whole website with uh, questions and answers about what's there. Uh, a good starting point, if you haven't contributed before, is to look at about 1% of your income. 50 bucks a month will give you $600 a year. That's halfway there. That's a good starting point. And um, for most people with a 60000 or more income, that's 1% of their income. So if you're a member, please contribute generously. Our minister has some great programs and things she'd like to do, but we have to fund them. We have to pay for them. And in this church, we're actually getting quite the bargain. I've talked to other churches. They're paying 1,500 per member, 2,000 per member. Some churches, if you see the big churches out in the suburbs, they require tithing. They require 10% of your income. That's how they build those big churches. So we're getting a real bargain here. We are. It doesn't. It may not sound like that, but we are getting a real bargain here uh, because of all the work we've done on rentals and casinos and things like that. But for membership, membership has a cost. So please give generously to our annual canvas. Thanks very much. Now let's sing from you. I receive. I'd like to call up Jan McMillan to do a special presentation to Ruth. Here's it. I'll bring you the I'll bring you the thing and there you go. Well, 
This is great. We're having such a wonderful day today. This is so nice to see everybody here. And I would like to call Ruth up for a present, a lovely token of our appreciation for everything you've done for us. And we're so honored to be able to celebrate this birthday with you. There you go, my dear. Happy birthday. <laughs> Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, and now we're going to sing a great song. I'm going to call up Coriolis Light uh, to sing uh, Strong is What We Make Each Other by um, Mary Gregolia. Oh, yeah, it's just the choir that needs to come up. If you're not in the choir, you don't need to stand up. I, that was confusing. Thank you, choir. That was great. Thank you. We're going to enter into a time of quiet meditation, still our hearts and our minds, and find our, our grounding, our center. And I ask you to plant your feet on the floor, if you wish, invite you. Everything is by invitation, nothing by demand. As, as you wish. Take a couple of deep breaths, if you like, with me. Breathing in and out. A couple more. And out. Give yourself a little wiggle. Let the chair hold you. Let it hold you up. Let the gravity pull you down knowing that you are safe. In your chair, on, lying on your bed, if you're at home, on the couch, on the floor, feel that gravity pull. 
Perhaps you're following your breath as it enters your body. What do you notice? Enter a few moments of silence. Then I'm going to read a poem by David White called Sweet Darkness. When your eyes are tired, the world is tired also. When your vision has gone, no part of the world can find you. Time to go into the dark, where the night has eyes to recognize its own. There, you can be sure you are not beyond love. The dark will be your womb today. The night will give you a horizon further than you can see. You must learn one thing. The world was made to be free in. Give up all the other worlds except the one to which you belong. Sometimes it takes darkness and the sweet confinement of your aloneness to learn that anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. We'll enjoy another few moments of silence. And then I'll read part of that poem again. You must learn one thing. The world was made to be free in. Give up all the other worlds except the one to which you belong. Sometimes it takes darkness and the sweet confinement of your aloneness to learn anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. Learn that anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. A few more minutes of si moments of silence and then Gordon will bring us out of the silence with a Celtic blessing.
and may the best you've ever seen be the worst you'll ever see, and may you I be just as happy as I wish you now to be. And may the blessing of the rain reach gently down upon your soul, and may it wash you fair and clean, and leave for you a shining pool which shines in blue earth and above. Sometimes perhaps a star may a lamp keep leafly raining to your own and love to thee. And may the best you've ever seen be the first you'll ever see. And may you I be just as happy as I wish you now to be. As I wish you now to be. Thank you. As is the custom in Unitarian Universalist congregations, we light candles of joy and concern. We have so much to be joyful for this morning, and there are concerns in our hearts. The lighting of candles allows us to gives us representation of those joys and concerns in our heart. I invite you now to come to either station, there's one on each side, to light a candle for whatever is in your heart and mind. Perhaps you might be thinking of what it is that makes you come alive. I invite you now.
you. There we go. And now I'll ask Karen to light a last candle for all the joys and concerns we hold in our heart that maybe needs to be expressed in other ways and representing this community and the love and caring that we have for one another. Nobody noticed that I didn't follow the order of service, did they? <laughs> I, th I thought we'd have a few naysayers in there. Sorry about that. The first reading that I have for you this morning is uh, by uh, James W. Fowler. It's called Stages of Faith, The Psychology of Human Development and the Quest for Meaning. And he says, Faith, rather than belief or religion, is the most fundamental category in the human quest for relation to transcendence. Faith, it appears, is generic, a universal feature of human living, recognizably similar everywhere despite the remarkable variety of forms and contents of religious practice and belief. Each of the ma major religious traditions studied speaks about faith in ways that make the same phenomenon visible. In each and all, faith involves an alignment of the will, a resting of the heart in accordance with a vision of transcendent value and power, one's ultimate concern. Faith classically understood, is not a separate dimension in life, a compartmentalized speciality. Faith is an orientation of the total person, giving purpose and goal to one's hope and strivings, thoughts and actions. And the second reading is by Eric Walker Wickstrom, from his book, Serving with Grace, Lay Leadership as a Spiritual Practice. And he says, the most superficial reason to come to church is because your church needs you. Or he says to become a leader is because your church needs you to. Our congregations are voluntary associations and depend on donations, not just of our financial resources, but of our time and talent as well. In fact, even if our members pledged sufficient financial support such that every single task could be farmed out to paid employees, Andrew would like that, I think. <laughs> yeah, he says. <laughs> the church would still need volunteers because that's the nature of a voluntary association. We also get involved in leadership because, well, it feels good. We meet people and form friendships, becoming more fully integrated into the community. Some of us stop there, of course, satisfying our own need for a sense of self, a sense of belonging, yet at the point there is also a doorway to service as a spiritual practice. The Reverend Gary Kowalski put it in a sermon. People who come to Unitarian Universalism seeking spiritual goods are likely to be disappointed so long as they have the outlook of consumers in search of material goods. If their connection to our liberal faith is to grow into something more rewarding, they have to give up the consumer mindset and begin to think of themselves instead as shareholders investors, co-owners in what happens in church. Just as bonded domestic people themselves are them, themselves as partner rather than competitors with a joint share in the success of the enterprise. And that's the end of the quotes. 
We, as Unitarian Universalists, have a hard time with words like faith. But we use the word regularly, don't we? For example, you might, I might say, I have faith in you. Or, I have faith that the sun is going to come up every morning. And I have faith that my car will start when I get into it. I have faith in my mechanic. And more importantly, I have faith in this congregation at this time. We as you use sometimes cringe at some words because we may have been spiritually wounded or see hate being done in the name of someone's faith or religious beliefs. However, my opinion only here, I think it's time we said enough of sidestepping of all the good and beautiful words that are out there. We get to use them too, and for our advantage. I might not believe in a God with a big white beard in the sky directing me and telling me that uh, they, he, she, they, whatever, have a plan for my life. I might not believe in a God of any kind. Or I might. And either is fine. I also have faith in the human potential. I have faith that nature will restore my soul. And by that I mean will ground me, bring me back to myself, help me remember what is really important in life. And like I said before, I have faith in this congregation, and I hope you do too. From the reading by Eric Wickstrom, if our connection to our liberal faith is to grow into something more rewarding, then we have to give up the consumer mindset and begin to think of ourselves more as shareholders, investors, co-owners of what happens in church. Well, this quote, are you sick of us talking about you yet, Ruth? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to talk about you again. So this quote makes me think of our honored guest, Ruth Patrick. If ever there was a shareholder in UCE, it is Ruth. She, as we will learn during the luncheon, has been faithful to this church. She's left a legacy, and she still supports the congregation with her attendance, her sharp mind and clear thinking. I've enjoyed her good counsel myself, her pledges, and her connection to UCE's history. What does it take to be a shareholder in UCE? They actually feel like this is your church that you have a say, that UCE is important in your life. Well, church has always been an important part of my life, and I have been known to say, and I have put it in bios, some, uh, biographies sometimes, like when you go to speak somewhere and they ask you for a bio. So I sometimes say this. I first attended church when I was nine days old, and I haven't missed many Sundays since. And that's a true story. The United Church in Melfort, Saskatchewan was actually where that occurred. My kids wonder why church is so important to me, even though I raised them in the church. So I don't understand why it's not important in their life. Oh well. Being part of a faith community like UCE means we have a kind of a built-in set of potential friends that we might share some values and principles with. There are events and programs we can attend giving us something to do and people to do them with. Being part of a faith community can teach us leadership skills if we decide to get involved. It's where I first discovered I had leadership potential. That and being a brownie leader. At UCE on Sunday mornings, you will have a chance to sing in a multi-generational setting. That doesn't happen in very many places anymore. 
And you could even join the choir. It's a good choir on Thursday evenings if it's some, singing is something you love. If you're interested in faith development, and by that I mean helping yourself and other people learn about themselves while growing peer personally and spiritually, you could join a small group, our Soul Matters groups. Emerging from COVID, we here at UCE have a chance to decide how we want to be together. Belonging to a congregation is one of the few places people from all walks of life and all stages and ages of life gather together for a common purpose. Don't you just love it when you see people gather together to share time, food, and fun? On the, at the Christmas Day gathering that we had here, I saw elderly folks sitting down with children that were not related to them, doing puzzles and playing board games. That made my heart so incredibly happy. In Buddhism, we are asked to have a beginner's mind. How does that relate to our discussion on faith and vulnerability, our Soul Matters theme of the month? The Buddha asks us to have a beginner's mind so that we can let go of our preconceptions, our need for control and power. From Richard Rohr, the older we get, the more we've been betrayed and hurt and disappointed, and the more barriers we put up to the beginner's mind. We move further away from the immediate delight and curiosity of small children we must never presume that we see, and we must nev always be ready to see anew. But it's so hard to go back and to be vulnerable and to say to our soul, I don't know anything. By and large, what blocks spiritual teaching is the assumption that we already know or that we don't need to know. Spirituality is about seeing. It's not about earning or achieving. It's about relationship rather than results or requirements. Once we see, the rest will follow. We don't need to push the river because we're in it. The life is lived within us, and we learn how to say yes to that life. That's the end of that quote. I sometimes describe church life as a river. People come floating down the river. You can imagine that. Come floating down the river or through our doors on a journey or they're looking for something. They find us swimming in this nice little area in the river. It's kind of a swimming hole. And they decide to hang out with us and, and swim for a bit. Or... These people are kind of not for me. And decide to carry on down the river to a different area. Whatever is fine. It's okay. We just need to be clear about what we are offering our fellow swimmers. What they can expect. How they will grow and develop. How much fun or work it will be to be with us. And how well we understand or don't understand relationships. And if you hang around with me long enough, you'll know that one of the things I say regularly is there is only one real thing that's important in life, and that is relationships. Fowler's Stages of Faith is based on stages of maturation, much like other theories of human development. In the quote from this morning, he says, faith classically understood is not a separate dimension of life, a compartmentalized speciality. Faith is an orientation to, of the whole person, giving purpose and goal to one's hope and strivings, thoughts and actions. Everyone has purpose, goals, hope, strivings, thoughts, and actions. 
Fowler is suggesting that faith is what gives us this purpose. It's not something out there, but rather in here. It's something that is part of us. So, to think about UCE as a faith community, if you can handle, if you, if you can think about that, we're saying that it has purpose, goals, hopes, strivings, thoughts, and actions. So, what is UCE's purpose? What can it hope for? What are the ne actions needed to keep UCE healthy and vibrant? Wickstrom suggests that, it, that if we're just here because it feels good, that might not be enough. He suggests that our satisfaction in being part of a UU community will be about the same as what we put into it. We get out what we put in. So if we decide to sit at the, rib, at the edge of the swimming hole and just dip a toe in, it'll be nice, well, it'll cool us off a bit. But if we decide we want to enrich our lives by jumping in, that's probably better. This month, we're talking about vulnerability. Today, we're talking about what being part of a community like UCE can do for us and how our lives are enriched and enlivened by being part of this community. Of course, we need you to be here on Sunday mornings to attend events and activities, to engage in small groups like Soul Matters, and to volunteer in areas that interest you. And, of course, it's Canvas Month, so I'd like to add my voice to Andrew's and say a couple of things about pledging. It means that you are in a relationship with UCE. Your pledge shows your faith in this organization and your desire to see it thrive and grow. And as Andrew said, if you're a member, it's your responsibility to pledge. Even if whatever it is that you can afford is all that you can afford, that's enough. And it brings you into a right relationship with UCE. And third, your pledge is a vote of confidence in this organization. You are saying that you like what's going on here and wish for it to remain as a place where people can belong. Next week, I'm, pardon me, next week I'm going to talk more about pledging. Oops. I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> because now you're going to stay away. I promise to make it fun, really. So don't worry, you can show up again. Being part of a congregation like UCE means you have rights and responsibilities. Ruth has certainly understood this and made being part of UCE a priority in her life, and we thank you for that, Ruth. She has understood, as many of you, that being part of a community living out our values and beliefs, and supporting something that is important to us is a pretty good way to make a life. Add in a loving family, some good friends, some delicious food. It doesn't get much better than that. We are lucky to be part of the multi-generational, multifaceted, and vibrant community. Or at least I know I'm lucky to be here. If you were to deepen your relationship with UCE, how would you do that? If you wished to delve into personal or spiritual growth, where would you look? If you were looking for something to do, where is the first place you might go? UCE can help with all of those questing, seeking, complex, and confusing questions and situations in our lives. That's what being part of a loving faith community can do for us, if we decide we wish to do it. Wickstrom says, the most superficial and practical reason to become a leader is that your church needs you. What if the reverse were actually true, too? The best reason to become involved is that you need UCE for you to become your best self. 
May we grow together individually and together as a community into our best selves. So may it be. Amen. And now we will sing our closing hymn. Let it to be a dance. The words will show up behind me. They have. And I invite you to rise as you are willing and able and sing with me hymn number 311. invite Joan to come forward and extinguish our chalice. While she does that, I will read words by Kendall Gibbons. There is, finally, only one thing required of us. That is to take life whole, the sunlight and the shadows together, to live the life that is given us with courage and humor and truth. We have such a little moment out of the vastness of time for all our wondering and loving. Therefore, let there be no half-heartedness. Rather, let the soul be ardent in its pain, in its yearning, in its praise. Then shall peace enfold our days, and glory shall not fade from our lives. Reverend Rosemary has a benediction for us. We'll then have a postlude, and then I invite you all to sing Carry the Flame. Or we'll stick a couple up. We're going to stick one thing in between there. Just, um, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll understand when we get there. And so, I offer you these words of benediction. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things break. They can break. And they can be mended. But not with time, as they say. With intention. So I invite you to go and love intentionally and love extravagantly and love unconditionally for the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is within you. Go in peace, gentle people, go in peace. And now our postlude and then an announcement. 
So, Coriolis. Coriolis is singing Shine Your Light by Greg Gilpin as our postlude. And now for the brief announcement. This sanctuary is going to get flipped into a banquet hall with all of our help. So I'm not actually sure who's in charge of making that happen. I'm in charge of making the announcement that we all need to help make that happen. <laughs> I have no idea how to do that or what to do. Jan does. Thank goodness somebody knows. Hang on, I'm going to give you a mic, Jan. All right, so we want... I uh, have tables there for a front a head table along the front here three of those and then I want nine tables in the room with chairs all around round tables they're in there go go for it okay stop 
Oh. I, we decided that since it's going to be a free-for-all and nobody's going to know what to do, that I'm going to say grace now. <laughs> Good idea, right? It's like, yeah, because I'm a minister and I was, we were talking about it and I says, yeah, but what about the blessing? We have to have a blessing. So let us have a blessing on this food today and on this community. And may the food nourish our bodies. And may our time together nourish our spirits, our souls. May there be laughter. And may all the hands that prepared the food know that we are extremely grateful. Amen. Okay, now go for it. Carry the flame. Carry the flame. <laughs> I only made three mistakes. <laughs>